Hey everybody and welcome to this episode of the Success School Podcast. I just want to say thank you so much for being here and taking time to listen to the show today. And I also just want to make sure you are aware that my whole mission with this podcast is to be able to give people access to conversations that are going to enlighten, they're going to inspire and they're going to give you the information needed to genuinely start to live a happier, a healthier and a more fulfilling life. But here's the thing, I am just one man. So that's really, really hard to get a lot of people to be positively impacted when I'm doing this alone. So I'm just going to ask a little favor. And I know you're probably sick of hearing this. You probably hear it on every podcast you listen to. But please, if you genuinely do think this podcast is valuable and can help people, if you could just take a second to hit that subscribe button, maybe go one further, tell other people about it, share it on your Insta stories, anything you can do to help bring more awareness to the show would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for being here, and I really hope you enjoy this episode. Sales, I feel, is really challenging for a lot of business owners in terms of their overall mindset. I feel like from a confidence perspective, um, a lot of people want to avoid selling. So for that reason, I feel like getting the sales master on tonight (laughs) is going to be, I don't know. So are you a sales master? Would you you like that title? Are we going to have that title? What do you think? I don't know. I think it's funny with sales. I I don't think that, I think what I used to think sales is, which most people here probably think it is, and what it actually is, is completely and utterly different. Mm. I think we have a big name badge on stuff and a lot of people shy away from sales. I'm proud to be in sales, but I also know from a fuckwit that didn't really have any qualifications at school that had to drag himself through a lot of the stuff. It's one of the only industries that doesn't discriminate about where you're from, what your knowledge is. If you put the work and you learn the skills, you can get paid the money without a time delay. So for me, I wouldn't say I'm a sales master, but I'm definitely a student of the game. Les, you touched upon there about it not being what you thought necessarily it initially was. Let's just dive straight into that. Yes. You know, we hear a lot of people, the phrase sales is sleazy or sale yes. or, or sleazy salesperson. Yes. If people have that attitude, What's your response to that first? There's loads of them. Uh, I don't know. People try and resist a lot of these objections and hurdles in life, but there are. But if we look at the crux of it, if we think any time anyone's tried to sell a product, it sells. So that's any pro- any business on the planet is trying to sell something. And what we're really saying is a person tried to sell me something in a way I didn't like. If we go back to the sleazy car salesman, if go back to the 60s where you had a car salesman in your local town, probably wearing a dodgy double-breasted suit like this, had a weird little quiff. He had five cars on the lot. He was just trying to feed his family. I don't think he was purposely trying to sell crap cars, but if his mortgage payment was late, he had five cars and he couldn't buy a new one until he sold it, maybe he was a bit of a div. But actually, that reputation, and we complain. I read something before that said, for every bad thing that happens, we complain 28 times. For every good thing that happens, we complain too. So even if I have the same amount of negative and positive experiences, the negative are going to get spoke about more. And there's always more passion. And we never tell the story as it is. So often I think there's the crap salespeople, the untrained salespeople, the ineffective salespeople, and then the people who like to elaborate on a story. And it all gets smashed together under sleazy salesperson. What's your mission with this? With what you do today, helping people with sales and and still, you know, closing deals yourself what's your overriding mission what is it you're wanting to achieve okay so there's two one i straight down i say this it makes a shit ton of money when you're good it makes a shit ton of money it doesn't it doesn't prejudge i'm very fortunate that because i'm an absolute numpty in in many areas i've had to learn and i've got quite a good skill but matt you could be on a phone call i don't even need to be in the room and based off of what you're saying i'll tell you what to say next That's quite a good ability, meaning I can train people. And I also realized, years ago, I realized if I'm out at sea and I have to tread water to survive, I would likely tread water more to keep you alive if we were there together than if I was on my own. And when you realize, why is that? I don't know. It's fucking weird. There's no reason. I don't have like a logical reason. I will just do more for other people to the detriment of myself. And that's not in a, oh, look at me. I'm so great. It's annoying. Like, it's really annoying, but that's a trait. So if that trait is a trait I have, doing something where my clients have access to me every day, 
Like I sent 80 voice notes a day plus calls. You've got to be mental to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be mental in a certain area, put yourself in a place where you're being mental is great and you get paid really, really well. And I get paid by teaching people but can't sell to sell. So that's great. If you'd be happy to go there, because I know a little bit of your story and it's not always Absolutely. been that way at all. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about what led you to this place of getting into sales, where you've come from and sort of that journey? Yeah. And so I, if we go back, I was a little shit at school. Um, I was only allowed to school one day a week when I was 15. My school, I still don't know if this was legal or not, but they basically said to a group of us, you can go and have a YTS job. And they basically just said, where do you want to work? I got, I chose to be a chef. God knows why. Still don't think this was legal. I got paid like 30 quid a week for about two years. Wasn't allowed on the school grounds. Definitely not legit, but the school was happy. It was the first time that I ever learned something that I enjoyed. Did really well. By the time I was 18, I was running my own restaurants. Got to 20 and I burned out. By that point, I had no qualifications, no skills. I could run a restaurant, hated restaurants. And someone just said, oh, you should get into sales. You're gobby. By the way, being gobby is not a prerequisite for being good at sales. And so I got into selling, doing door to door, got chased by German shepherds, had things thrown at me by kids, thinking we were Jehovah's Witnesses, nothing against Jehovah's Witnesses, they just definitely did. And I really sucked at it. And I couldn't work out the difference between the guy that was making 300 quid a day and the person who was making zero. And I asked for help, didn't want to help, um, hardly surprising. And I listened to the guy, I hid around the corner and listened to the top guy knocking on doors. And here was the interesting thing. The difference between the person that sucked and the person that was great was about 15, 20%. That was it. Wasn't massive. But if you shoot at a goal in football and you're 15% off target, you are never scoring a goal. You've got to be on target. And sales is exactly the same. So that progressed. Um, I progressed, I progressed, I progressed. I ended up setting up my own businesses, had a couple of businesses. Life was good, made good money. Um, but the downfall for me was I started to live a party lifestyle as well. Mine was very much, I could stay up for three days without drinking, without sleeping, drinking, taking drugs, and I could still stand in front of 20 people and sell, which is mental. That's not a good way to live. But How old were you at this point? Oh, 20... 29 30 why why do you think you could still function like that do you feel like you just what was it you just a good blagger like how no, do my you... body just didn't care my body would just i could i could go out and i would get to a point where i just didn't seem to get pissed or i didn't seem to get any more high and i could still work and i'd get high and i'd get a laptop open and i'd start doing stuff and working i'd be in my zone where a lot of people need to go in a pub and party I was like, everyone had seen the film Limitless. I didn't do as well as him, but it was a bit like that. I was like, ding, 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 ding. And so that progressed for me. But the problem is it was a rocky road because although the money was going up, internally, my body was keeling over. But what I thought I was doing after that seven or eight, this went on for like seven or eight years, was over time, my life was getting worse. I was spending 200 quid a day on Coke. I was out four days a week. Like, I mean, like going back to my home, a shower and going straight to the office. And I thought what I was still doing was good and it wasn't. It was just completely off. And mm -hmm. I, by the time I realized I fucked my whole business up, everything was completely to shit. I ended up losing my house, losing the business, losing the car, losing the watches, losing every. I mean, literally, I should have been retired and lost it all. And then the sad part of well, a sad, ironic, funny the only thing I had was the ability to sell. And it was the only thing I had. Someone literally phoned me up and he's like, Dave, I'm really sorry about the everything going to shit. Are you still any good at that sales thing? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, we're going to come in because my sales team suck. And I went in, sat in this office with a bunch of miserable people who hated their jobs, hated selling, hated their lives. And we made an extra 19 and a half grand for the company in like three days. And I was like, oh, this is all right. And so from there, I was like, I'll do that again. I'll go and do that again. And so then from that stage, the phoenix from the ashes was, I actually found a thing that I really enjoyed that I was good at. And I think sometimes you have to go through all of that shit 
to really find the thing that actually matters. And there's always a good lesson after. Yeah. You just have to let the pain fucking leave first. Because if the pain there is completely blinkered. On reflection, as you look back on that time, you know, if you, if what you're saying is actually business was going well and you was good at selling before the, the crash and burn, as you look back now, what was it that was driving the parties, the drugs, the drink? I'll tell you what it was. Business was good. So I was, I was in a relationship. I had two kids. And suddenly the mum decided randomly, I'm moving the kids away. And that was when the spiral really happened. I was fine. Find my kids on my weekend. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't care. As soon as they went back on a Sunday night, the next 10 days, and they saw them every other weekend, was mm. apt because they hated being at home. And it wasn't for years later I realised this after a very sensible conversation with someone else. And I realised this because when I, after the breakdown, because I had a complete breakdown, lost everything, when I was doing the rebuild, I moved, I purposely went, I need to be near my kids. I miss my kids. I realised this, blah, blah, blah. So I moved so I could see them all the time. From that point, I literally gave up drink, gave up drugs, haven't smoked, and I haven't had a drink in five. I haven't, I haven't, yeah, four or five years, five years now. And I'm not bothered because I love being a dad and I'm pretty lucky. I've got some fucking epic kids, but that's my, that's my centerpiece. Mm -hmm. So if you mm -hmm. take someone's centerpiece out, it's like taking gravity off the planet, right? Everything just fucking floats around randomly. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's, until it's your so interesting. Your it's so interesting you say that. I was speaking recently to a relationship expert, Dimple Thakra, and we speak about this exact thing. And I think, you know, it's not exclusive to men, but in men, in, in ambitious men in general, what we can do is get so caught up in business and goals and achieving. Yes. And we can take the ones we love for granted and it can be a hard balancing act. And I always remember her saying to me, but if the relationships aren't right at home, the business crumbles anyway. Yeah. Everything else, that's like the catalyst. And I just thought it's a really, it's similar to what you're saying there, really at the Can heart of it. Can I make a point it. on that as well? Do you know something I've realised about being a dad, which is different than being a mum? And everyone who's got kids can judge me on this. I can sit in a room with my kids and I get their energy by just being in the room with my kids. My kids don't even need to talk to me. And I have a sense of purpose. Just because part of my job is a protector in the same way that the shepherd can sit there while the sheep all play on the field and they have purpose in their life because they're still protecting their flock. They are around their flock. They get the energy from the flock. That's what happens for me as a dad. So actually, I can be in my kids' lives all the time. My kids can sit while I work. But my boy could also sit next door and I know he's there and he's happy and I still feel energised off the back of it. And I think that's the big difference. We get our adrenaline hit from playing with our kids, but we also get a high dose from being the protector and the provider. And so sometimes, foolishly, we overcompensate with that side because then we're fulfilling on our uh, internal satisfaction rather than necessarily being the um, more sort of kinesthetic, touchy-feely, huggy side. We go out and we'll stand out in front of a house in case there's a burglar all night, and that's actually our job. And we get an emotional connection from it. And I think that's where, in the job world, it can really fuck with us. Mm, yeah, I've spoke to some business owners just recently about that exact thing and where, as you say, they can, it's almost like ego. They get caught up in striving for that next business goal and they kid themselves saying, it's for my family, it's for my family. And actually, a lot of the time, right. they're like, I don't need that. Like, yeah, we, yeah, we just want you to be present. It. Yeah. yeah, we just want you to be there and to give us that emotional connection. And we sometimes can easily lose, lose sight of that. I know you've just kind of very quickly touched upon some pretty epic horrendous laws right yeah. there and uh, obviously there'll be people listening to this that are in different stages of, with their life with their business and people on different journeys i wondered if you'd be willing to kind of just share a little bit more about right, some whatever of you the, want the, right we, we'll go there then we're going in just some of the worst the very lot but in terms of how you can remember it now how bad did it get oh yeah i mean i and i i so because i've spoke about this a lot i don't shy away from it so sometimes when I say stuff, I will lose some of the emotional context behind it. But it's as bad as it gets. Like, I've tried ending my life three times, fucked it up, fortunately. I was at the stage in my life that, and it sounds so dramatic now, I couldn't imagine two months down the line. Like, and it's not like, oh, woe is me, I was crying. I was literally like, 
Just co- you couldn't even imagine that. I couldn't envisage the summer. I couldn't see my next birthday. I couldn't imagine seeing my kids grow up. And so when you get to that stage, and I say it's a bit like having a radar for your t- like an, an aerial for your TV. If it's fucking broke, you're not getting a good picture, right? And if you're at the stage now where you're depressed, you're high, you're lonely, you're lost, your radar's off. And if you, the whole point about this for me was, I so I went for a stage of when I had the breakdown, I realized my antenna was broke. And because I knew my judgment was so bad, I had to spend six months. This is mental. Whatever I wanted to do, I did the opposite. So if I wanted to stay up, I probably needed to go to bed. If I wanted to stay in bed, I probably needed to fucking get up. If I wanted to go and see my mates, I probably needed a bit of solitude. And actually, if I didn't want to go out, I probably need to get out of the fucking house and see people. So it starts with that self-awareness, recognizing yes. my judgment, my location. decisions. Are... Yeah. You have to know your location. And a lot of us, we spend a lot of time shining this beautiful light on social media, tell everyone how fucking great it is that we start believing our own BS. But we're actually sliding down the hill in like the muddy, <laughs> but have ever gone out when it's muddy. And it's like sliding down. You're trying to get grip and you're just going further away the more you try. And the more that happens in our life, we have to know. If you're in a bad place, know you're in a bad place. But it doesn't actually make it much worse. There's actually an empowering part. But when we stop lying to ourselves about our location and we're honest, we're honest, it makes a difference. One of my favorite phrases to me is I'm the dumbest today that I'll ever be. And I've had people before go, oh, my God, you can't say that about yourself. Be nice. I'm like, listen to what I'm saying. Today is the dumbest I will ever be, as in I'm going to get smarter every day. But if I say I'm getting smarter every day, it sounds too rah-rah. I need to say this is the dumbest I'm going to be. Every time I make a mistake, it's okay. This is the dumbest I'm ever going to be. Every time I screw up, it's okay. This is the dumbest I'm ever going to be. And that for me works better because I know my location and I know where I come from. And I know I will push myself out of pain far better than I will move towards desire. And that's everything for me. What about in terms of actually getting support to help you recover and move forward? Was the things that worked, things that didn't work? I did AA, did CA, didn't like it. I went to Cocaine Anonymous and I went out the night after, about night. I told everyone my story and I got so hyped up by it. I was like, fucking hell, sounds great. Went out and, I did, and got high. So you've got to be careful about just going and telling yeah. your story. Going and telling mm. your story doesn't fucking help. It actually elevates it. I didn't. I didn't hate my life. The demise of it was bad. I used to love the partying. So people getting me to talk about the partying was great. Made you want to go and party, right? Yes. I had, a, I had like nine strippers that were my best mates and a suite at a local hotel that we just party there. Like it wasn't a bad time in that bubble, but everything else around it was the problem. So me going and talking about that didn't help. Do you know what I needed to do? I needed to look down and go, what I'm doing now, if my kid was here watching me, would I do it? If my kid was doing this when they're 20, would I want them to do it? If my kids could see this now, would I want to do it? There's a really great quote by Joe Rogan, uh, well, like a saying, and he says, imagine for a moment that in the future there's time travel and you've made your life a fucking success. You're worth 100 million. Everyone knows you. You're great. And they send back in time a secret film crew to film the rise of your success. All your struggles, all your hardships, all your pain, all those lonely moments, just like we see in those films where they've got to talk to themselves in the mirror. And they're sad and it's fucking raining. Act like that's going on. And that, for me, was a really big thing. It spurred me on massively, because every time I was in that moment, I was like, this is the shit bit of the film. This is the bit where Rocky's had his ass handed to himself. This is the part when a guy's lonely. This is the part just before the good bit of music comes in and it's suddenly the comeback. We've got to go through these points, but we've got to recognize that when them ha- they happen, what are we going to do? What are the steps we're going to take and how we're going to move forward in our life? And that's so important to be able to do. It's a really great way of looking at it. I feel like often when we're going through the shit, it can feel isolating. We can feel like we're a failure. We're a loser. Yes. And something I often say to people is like, give me a success story that didn't go through the shit. Like, yeah. It just doesn't exist. And when you recognize the difference between those who succeed and those who fail, is not that they didn't go through adversity and challenge and suck and be shit and have failures and all those things. It's just the fact they kept going. Yeah. You start to go, ah, oh, actually, this is just part of the journey of success. It's not actually failure. And you I know think why it's so really shit good... for people as well? Sorry to interrupt. The reason it's so shit for people, when we feel low about ourselves, is because we know we're made for more. 
Mm. I've got mates out there that are happy as fuck doing fuck all. And all credit to them. They're happy yeah. as fuck. Same. I envy right. that sometimes. The I think that's an easier life. We are made for fucking more. Right. If agreed. You no, know you're not living to your fucking potential. Of course, you're going to be sad. Of course, you're going to be fucking lost. Of course, you're going to feel fucking lonely. Yeah. yeah. But the yeah. problem is, it's not staying in that place. It's using that energy. Because here's the thing. When you're fucking sad and tired and anxious, you do often have energy. You just use it for cleaning the fucking house. Procrastination. Anything but. Life. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever yeah. it is. Right. There's always something out there that we go and do it. Or we spend an hour moaning to our fucking mate or whatever it is. What about if you locked yourself in a fucking room and I'm not coming out until I've done X, Y and Z? What about I'm going to go and help someone? One of my favorite things now, if I'm in a shit day, shit's against me, I go and do something for someone else. Go and buy a fucking homeless person some food. I've got an orphanage in Uganda I work for. I'll just phone up Mandela and go, what can we do today? What can we do today? It's going to fucking move the needle. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. But when you go out there and you feel like shit and you go and help someone else, inside there's a little bit of your fucking soul that gets a bit of heat. And that little bit of heat's enough to get you to the next state. And it's momentum, next, right? It's energy. Yeah. And that's yeah. what gets our momentum. We yeah. are the momentum, whether we have it or not. It doesn't come from some fucker else. And we've got to realize the fact that we're in that control point. We're just holding the fucking brake lever. Beautiful. Right, Dave, let's go into the sales stuff, because I know there's lots that people yes. would love to get from you on that topic. Let's start with small business owners. I'm talking about the quote unquote one man band, the person yes. that's, you know, they're having to create the products, deliver the service and product. They're having to market the product. They're having to, whilst deliver it, be selling to have more people, you know, the personal trainers, the coaches, so on. In and then and then for a lot of them, selling's the bit they don't like. Creating yeah. the stuff they enjoy, delivering it they enjoy. They know they're getting results for people. They need to manage the time to make more time for sales, but they avoid it, they procrastinate, they don't enjoy it, they don't feel good at it. Yes. Could you maybe just give some advice that speaks to that and how to help them move forward? Johnny, honest, honest answer, or do you want this fluffy answer? No fluff. Let's go through. The it. honest answer is we're all fucking spoiled. We will live a luxurious lifestyle where no one's going to fucking die if we don't do the shit. Your mates aren't going to moan it if you don't make the effort. They're actually going to do the fucking opposite. Most people are going to keep you where you are. And actually, we don't like discomfort. If we think of a difference between, forget about you having a job. Think of a difference between an amateur and a professional. What's the difference between an amateur? Think of a Sunday league footballer, right? What do they do? Go out on a Saturday night, get absolutely smashed, turn up on a Sunday, rely on the skills they had when they're 18, now they're 30 and fat. They score an absolute blinder, sit in a local social club, and everyone thinks they're a fucking hero. That's definitely not what the pros are doing. The pros do shit, but they don't want to do because they know it moves the needle. An amateur does shit until they can just about get it right. A professional does it till they can't get it fucking wrong. And that's where the good shit is. The very shit that we hold back off of doing is the thing we need to do. And you know what it is. Because you sit and talk to yourself when you're looking at your fucking computer. You look at yourself in the mirror at night when you're going to go to sleep and go, oh, why didn't I do it? Oh, why didn't I do that last week? No one needs you to tell you what to do. There might be strategies and methods, but we'd all be great at doing advice for someone else. And what a lot of people are really good at doing is find someone that you trust who's on the same journey and give each other some fucking feedback. Because mm -hmm. it's very easy to do it for someone else. We're all good at advice. advice. But a lot of us are assholes. You ever heard of an asshole? They fucking ask all the time, don't take the fucking advice, and then they moan like it doesn't work. But actually, a lot of us are assholes sometimes. And we're asking for an opportunity. And we're asking, why isn't life easier? We're asking, why? Do you know how fucking great life is? Imagine going back to the 70s and going, listen here, do you want your own TV channel? That literally, I will record a video and I'll give you a fucking camera and it'll be on your phone. You can phone a thousand people off your phone for less than a tenner. And I'll give you access to two, four TV channels for free every single day. You can post on that TV channel 24-7, 365. All you need is an internet connection. Imagine that in the 70s. People have gone mental. That's what you have on social media. That's literally what you have on your phones. You have a TV channel. If I asked you now that all oh, you got a business, would you like to be on ITV tonight at six o'clock? Everyone would be like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. You could get more viewers on a TikTok video than you could on ITV. And you're sat playing Candy Crush. Whilst <laughs> right watching ITV usually. 
Yeah. Okay. So it's a perspective shift, right? It's a mindset yes. shift. What about from an emotional standpoint though? If logically they get that, but emotionally they're still absolutely shit scared of putting themselves out there. What would be some advice to get them that first step to okay. create that momentum? So stop taking such big steps and stop telling everyone what your fucking steps were. The reason we don't do the step is because you want to celebrate that first step. Yeah, I did that. That's not what you need to do. You need to gradually get better. I think someone said before, I think it was Tony Robbins talking about smokers. When people are like, I've given up smoking for 64 days. It's like, why are you fucking counting? If you've planned on giving up for the rest of your life, why are you counting? You just say, I'm not a smoker. But you want everyone to know that it's been 66 days. Yeah. Think you still smoking. identify you're a smoker quitting, right? It's exactly. a totally different mindset. So instead of going like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make this phone call. I'm going to get this deal. No. If you don't want to do a post, po post something completely blank. Set up a fake account that has no picture of anyone. Get in the habit of doing the action without expecting a reward. They're also needy, like lap dogs sometimes. They'll give me a treat. Like I did a really good trick. Someone will give me claps. Most of the shit we ever do is not going to get celebrated. Everyone, would, If Elon Musk wasn't worth trillions of dollars, everyone would think he's fucking mental. The geezer talks about going to Mars and putting microchips in your head. I realize how mental that sounds. But because he's a trillionaire, everyone's like, oh, that's a really good idea, Elon. You are that person. You just don't have the results. So you've got to stop seeking the validation from people. You've got to do simple things. Everyone in this room right now could open their phone, take a photo, post it. You could set up an account on Instagram. Go and set Doris at yahoo.co.uk. Open an Instagram account and start posting random shit about other people. Set up a theme page, something about your industry. Go and search viral videos on TikTok and duet it with a blank screen. None of that involves your face, your image, your voice. None of your friends or family will ever know that you've done it. Here's a crazy idea. It might work. And if it doesn't, no one sees it. This is one of the big things about socials as well and phone calls. If you do social media and it's shit and it only gets five views, only five people know that you posted it. No one else in the world knows because no one saw it because it was shit. I say it all the time. I, people saw it. I say to a lot. I say to a lot of people with respect to you and to me, we can't fail at this level. Like we're not no. big enough to genuinely fail. So just play, just get used to the process, get used to doing, right? If you want to see hate, go to my TikTok account and go to my comment section. This is why I've got white hair. I'm, a tr I'm at the stage now. I am welcoming the hate. People give me so much shit and it drives the algorithm. But I know the ratio for every shit comment. I know how many leads we generate. So every time someone says something shit, I'm like, that's three people that have downloaded the playbook. Brilliant. I'll take that one shitty comment. And all you've got to have is a good repertoire of stupid stuff to stay people. I love winding people up. The problem that we have is we take this all personally. Now take it to the flip side, phone calls, messaging. You haven't ever been trained. Imagine if I told you, yeah, I'm going to become a doctor. You're going to go to college. No, 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 no. I'm just going to, I'm just going to wing it. Yeah, yeah, just drop in a hospital. Yeah, I think you... That's not going to work, right? About a drive. Imagine I'm going to be a rally driver. Ever drove a car? No, no, no. It's all right. Helicopter pilot. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to watch YouTube. Just get us in. None of that would make sense. So why do you think you're going to be a master communicator when you haven't fucking studied it? You can't become a great helicopter pilot without being in a helicopter. You can't get good at sales without having sales conversations. Mm. Okay, so let's say we're on day one of training. How would you start if someone's brand new to sales? What's some of the first few pieces of advice on how to sell correctly? It's going to sound really backward. Don't try and sell. It sounds really stupid. Like if you're in a conversation and you've got, if, I, if I've got a product, whatever the product is, whatever the service is, and you've got a lead in front of you and it says, Matt Hall, phone number, and you've got to pick him up, pick up that phone and phone Matt Hall, Instead of going, right, I've got to find Matt Hall, I've got to introduce him, he's going to probably give me objections, I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, then he's going to get excited, then if he wants to, what am I going to do if he wants to? That all sounds paralyzing, right? What about this? You phone up and have a 30 second conversation. 30 seconds. Really, really simple. If that's your first point of contact, you can get a phone, put a phone, and go, ah, did it. Fucking hell, that wasn't that painful. You didn't sell anything. 
But now imagine it here. Say Matt's here and I'm here. My product's here. What I'm really trying to do, instead of trying to get Matt going, vroom, what I'm doing, imagine if this is a road, imagine the street lights all the way down it. Just get into the first street light. Get to the next street light. Get to the next street light. Get to the next street light. Everyone's in such a rush. Now imagine if you've got 50 leads and they're all at different points of different street lights. Do you know what happened after a while? Leads start falling into deals. And then you start getting traction. Now you've got a pipeline. If I find up Matt now about any conversation, my job isn't to sell him. It is purely to build up a little bit of curiosity and set an opportunity we could talk about later. That could be whenever. I phone people up all the time. Go and watch my TikTok stuff. We do it to businesses. We phone them up and say, hey, it's Dave Angel. It's a sales call. You probably want to hang up, right? And they go, what? Do you want to hang up? Well, give me 30 seconds. I'll tell you on a call. It's amazing. How many people hang up? Cool. I don't care. Wasted no time at all. And if they go, you've got 30 seconds. <sighs> Take a little breath. I've now got 30 seconds. Do you know how long 30 seconds is to explain what you do? And I literally turn around and go, oh, right, Matt. So I normally get brought into businesses, pretty successful businesses like you. They've got a sales team and they know they could be selling a bit more. They want to make more money, but they don't want to spend any money on a guy with white hair. But you're probably going to tell me that everyone in your business is making so much money. You're about to get on a private debt to the Maldives, right? They always say, no, nowhere near. I'm not trying to sell it. Do you see how easy this can be? Reverse what psychology. Doing... Yes. So I'm phoning. I'm telling him what it is. I ask for 30 seconds. I then have something to say for 30 seconds. And then the idea is to get him to say no instead of yes. Because everyone loves saying no on a sales call. And now he said no. And then I go, oh, my God, really? Oh, I, I thought you were on a private jet. They laugh. I laugh. And I go, I said I was going to have 30 seconds. Can I take 30 seconds more? Or are you going to be completely offended? Sure, Dave. Okay, great. Now, you said, ah, da, da. can I ask you a quick question to see even if it would be a fit? Sure. Okay, two questions. Da, 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 da. Da, da. Okay, because you said this. Should we have another call? Maybe if I send you an email. Would that be a... Do you see how easy that could be? I think as well, you just said there about see if it would be a good fit. And I think at the heart of it, for anyone listening now, if you struggle with sales, remember that your job, and this is my take, correct me if I'm wrong, but your job isn't to close as many people as possible. Your job is to see if what you have to offer is genuinely going to help the person. Yes. And when you flip that and you actually, this is not about me selling. This is about me figuring out if actually this is right for you and this is so you're actually doing them a service. Yes. And I think flipping that in terms of building confidence to be able to do it changes the game. I think where people go wrong is they go, I just need to make X amount today. I need yeah, to yeah, close yeah. enough people. I need to, I need to be and a it super becomes, closer. Yeah. yeah. Fuck off. Fuck. And that's where it becomes unethical. You then start trying to convince people that it's right for them, even when it isn't. So I think that flipping it like that in itself is an important one that can help. I'll give you a quick point on this as well. If you're worried about losing deals, Let's say, give us an idea of a business. What's the business that someone else here has got? Uh, there's some personal trainers here. Okay. So imagine for the moment that I'm a personal trainer. Max put his details in. I go and make contact with eight other personal trainers that I know, like, and respect, but don't do exactly the same shit. And I say, hey, listen, sometimes I get people that I don't really want to work with or they're not a fit. If I handed you over that client, what would it be worth to you? 350 quid. Okay, cool. If I was to do that... What would you give them and what would it be worth to you for me to do it? You've now set up an affiliate process. Now you don't give a fuck. Now you can genuinely get on the phone call and be like, what are you actually trying to do? Oh, hang on a minute, Matt. Actually, do you want to, I've got a guy who does meal prep if you want to talk to him. Okay, cool. Oh, okay, cool. Suddenly you've got like six products and now you become the centerpiece of, hey, do you hate talking to personal trainers? Do you genuinely think everyone's going to shove you into it? I've got a back catalogue of eight experts in eight different areas. DM me the word PT for real, and I'll send you a breakdown of how they could help. Now you're a facilitator around the product, and you're still making money, but you get to cherry pick the clients you want to work with. Now it doesn't matter if you get rid of them. You still make money. Everybody wins. Exactly. That's a better way to sell. All right, I'm going to dive into a couple of things that... Yes. I myself, I'm not completely sold on yes. things that I've been uncertain about that I've had experiences with in the past. And there's, there's two, one is sales scripts and one is cold calls. Now let's start with sales scripts. Like right. 
I can fucking definitely help you with this. For me, no answer. Look on my desk. And there, there we go. There's one there. Right. Well, here's the, here's the thing. And I'm just going to give an opinion, right? I'm going to give an opinion and I'm going to give it to challenge sales scripts because I'm sure this is an objection that many, many other people feel. And if they feel this way, they're not going to use them. They're not going to get the benefit of them. So sales scripts to me, even as you were speaking it through there, sounds thought through smart ass, already thought ahead, already thought how to counter my objection. It's scripted. And when I've been on the end of sales scripts, i.e. somebody delivering one to me, I know it is. And for that reason alone, I'm like, I'm fucking out. You're just trying to get me to manipulate my mind so I buy some it so you make your commission. Because I know that, anyone I'm sure that would sort of testify on here, one of the things I get taught, like one of my pieces of feedback I get a lot is so authentic. Matt's so authentic, is authentic. And a lot of why I get sales is because I don't do sales scripts. Yes. I just talk from the heart, shoot from the hip, and I'm relatable and real. And it feels like the two can't coincide. There's the salesy stuff and there's the authenticity, and it feels like the two don't cross over. What's your kind of response to that? You can be right and you can be wrong at the same time. So you, your business clearly works. Here's what you don't know. How many deals you lost from it? How many yeah. people lost the call with you but didn't get the help they needed from you and their life is still in a fucking shit place. And it genuinely is. And here's, that's the unused metric, which we don't look at. We don't know how much we fucked it up. Now that could also work on scripts. Here's the other part I'd say to you is when I've done it on this call, because you know, it is a sales conversation because you know, we're talking about sales you are automatically, your little beacons are going ding, 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 ding. Oh, I know that. I've heard that before. So it's actually down to the delivery. And if I'm talking to you now, and I'm, I could say the same thing in 500 different ways. And then it's more like a word track. And word tracks are small scripts that are bolted together. You say to me, listen, I don't even know if I could use you. And go, mate, you're probably right. And to be completely frank, at this stage, I probably wouldn't even take your money. But can I ask you a quick question before I, I could say that, or I could say, mate, 100%, you shouldn't give me any money until we know we can help. Can I ask you a quick question to completely different tone, slightly changed in words, but the current underneath it is the same thing. Embrace it, deflect it, ask permission to ask a question. So it's almost like it's more important, obviously delivery, but it's more important to have these guides rather than necessarily yeah. following a script and 100. making it sound like a script, right? And also, if you're being taught a script by someone who doesn't know, think of it like being playing sports. And we go, OK, I want you to get the ball, tackle him, run around there, run up to the wing and cross it. That might work if you're new to football. You need that framework. You turn around to the best football in the world, go, mate, here you go, no, I'm going to run straight through the fucking middle. I'll do what I need to do because they are highly trained. The problem is most people are not trained. So what we've got to be able to do is go through the stage of being completely untrained, become effective at it and get to the stage of being unconsciously competent. Most people are not. They hear some jazzy one liner and they use it like a cheesy pickup line in a fucking bar. That's the dumb shit that no one likes. But actually, most conversations I have, we have a transcription service that listens in the background. My average sales call, I talk 17 percent of the conversation. 17 in a 45 minute conversation and a lot of my time i'll be on a zoom call and i'm like this what that makes no sense no disagree disagree and i literally say stuff like that people say stuff go nope that's absolute bollocks then i'll be what do you mean it's not bollocks and they'll go off on a tangent for the next two minutes but that's because i've done this for 20 years if i got someone who's completely new in sales and they went that's bollocks most people would likely get offended because yeah. the tonality and the emphasis and stuff so we've got to commit to becoming great, but we've got to prepare to suck before we become great. Most people out there have done a sport or a game or they've done something where we just had a natural flow. And then you tried and you sucked because now you're trying to get all your ducks in a row. So, yes, if you are naturally gifted and you are a naturally or you are already a very good communicator. So because you're a good communicator, do you need to be told to use a script? No, but your brain thinks very fast very relatable, you have a very trustworthy face, you have an automatic trustworthy tone, and you don't look like you fucking lie. 
I look like I fucking lie. I look like a dodgy salesman. <laughs> right? So with all of these areas, there's got to be a different conversation. In the same way, two women could walk into a room and be judged completely differently. Should we be judged? No. But we are. We are. And we all judge everyone else as well. Yeah. But we've got to fall into the play, but we own who we are. We know where our strengths and weaknesses are. And if you suck at sales, the best way to get better is to learn a structure, a structure, a strategy, and a framework to get good. If you're kicking ass in sales and your bank balance reflects that, keep doing you. And I think that's the big part here. Quick question for you, the listener. This is probably the most important question you will answer today. Have you got your tickets to our next event yet? Seriously, guys, I'm not just bigging this up because it's my event. Genuinely, this is going to be one of the best events of 2025. Out of everything that I do, I can honestly say this is the thing I put the most energy, effort, attention into. And it's one of the things... I enjoy the most. Enhance Your Brand is happening. This is our fourth live event here at Success School, and it's going to be a day jam-packed with incredible speakers talking about business, mindset, sales, and marketing. And not only is there going to be some incredible speakers, but you get to network with a room filled with other fellow Success School listeners. This is going to be a room filled with people who are committed to being the best version of themselves, which I would say it's going to be quite a good room to be in if you want to achieve more in your life. So if you haven't already, make sure you click the link in the show notes, get your tickets, and I'll be so excited to see you there on Sunday, the 2nd of February. You don't want to miss out. Get your tickets. Do it now. Now. Pause. Get your tickets. Have you got them yet? Right. We'll get back to the episode. My thing with cold calls is I don't think many people like the idea of being cold called. I, for one, don't like phone calls full stop. I'm like, if it's not scheduled in, like send me a voice note, send me a message, because that's the thing of I get to look at that on my time when I've got time to look at it. But a phone call, I've had that perception that it's somebody saying they want to speak with me right now because it suits them. So it needs to suit me. So because I've got that perception of I think it's rude the last thing I want to do is do that to others. So yes. kind of two two questions is, is one, how can I change my perspective on that? And two is, do you need to do cold calls to, to successfully sell? Or is there another way? So you don't need to do cold. So cold calls are typically done on a B2B basis. Phoning businesses is completely different than phoning B2C. Someone sat at home having a bourbon biscuit and a coffee while the kids are running around in the, place. the garden is very different than phoning a sales director at a company who has a sales team, for example. Also, a lot of businesses that are out there are not going to be actively doing it. So it depends if you're doing B2B, business to business, or B2C, business to consumer. Now, for you to do business to consumer, you're going to have to have their details. So that means they put their details in at some place. Now, here's a problem. If you're cold calling to sell them, it's very different. But if let's say Matt's come through onto one of our playbook leads and I phone you up and go, Matt, Dave Angel, I know you're going to hate me phoning you. Do you ever listen to podcasts? You're likely going to turn around and say, yeah, I've got a podcast link. I think it could help you. Listen to it. Minute 13. That's all I'm going to ask you to do. I think it'll really help you with A, B and C. Would you be completely offended if I send you it? Most people are going to say, no, cool. I'll send it over. That's easy enough to do a call. Now what happens if Matt goes and listens to that podcast? He's like, I fucking Dave's a nice guy. Mm. That was actually really helpful. Now you could do that 20 different areas. We do it with businesses now where we sign up on Google for alerts about their company. Everything comes up. We say, hey, quick one. Did you see the article that's just come out about you guys? No, I don't worry. I didn't think you would because I know you're busy. Do you mind if I send it over? Yeah, cool. Da, da, da. Anyway, what's going on with... Because we're adding value to their life. No one wants, hey, it's Dave. Want to have a conversation about solar panels? No one cares about that shit. No one cares. Mm. And no one cares what we sell. But if we can add value and you can find a reason to contact them, which makes them go, oh, fuck, yeah, I'll have that. Now there's a conversation. Go back to the street lamps. This is why it's so important to work out how to follow up with your clients that makes their life easier but makes their life better. Samuel L. Jackson was cool because he didn't tell us he's cool. If he was like, listen, I'm a cool motherfucker, we'd have been like, no, you're not, you dick. 
So if you phone people up with a deliberate action of trying to sell them, automatically resistance will go up and flow will be reduced. If you phone up and add value to their life, you're going to keep a small amount of flow and you're not going to elevate that resistance. And if you keep adding enough flow with low resistance, then there comes curiosity and interest. People are too quick to try and sell. Does that answer the question? 100%. And following on from that, I've heard you say that you should sell how your buyer wants to buy. Yes. Could you just give a bit of support on what that means in terms of how do we know how our buyer wants to buy from us? What are the wrong ways to sell to certain people? Any advice on that? Yeah. One, stop beating yourself up. Have conversations with people. Just be a human. Like it's the fucking easiest thing in the world to be a human. And I think people really downplay this whole being a human being. It's quite easy. Like have a conversation if you fuck it up. Do you know how many phone sales pitches I've completely screwed up? And I, I saw them. you posted one literally today, oh, right? On your Instagram. Today, I completely fucked it up. I talked over him. I asked him four questions about shutting the fuck up. Completely ruined it. And I posted on social media. Do you know what happened? We get leads from that because they're like, fuck, you make mistakes too. So mm. do I. I'll do a poll tomorrow. How many times have you fucked up a sales pitch? And people will vote. We'll get 100 people vote. We'll reply to them. Hey, would you like to see a free training on how you can fix it? Sure, Dave. Why not? Because you make mistakes and so do I. We've just generated leads. Yeah. And it's all that building rapport, relatability, exactly. authenticity. And it's just being normal. So when you're going out, so there's different things that are out there. Work out who you are, then immediately focus on those people. That's great. But as your business grows, you want to be able to talk to different types of people. For example, I talk to loads of really apathetic, boring, analytical buyers. They love a stat. Mm -hmm. They love a chart. If I can send them an article with a lot of charts on it, it, it doesn't even matter what's on the x-axis or the y-axis. I couldn't give it. I genuinely couldn't care. And I will tell them, I've got a really boring chart here that you're going to absolutely love. It breaks <laughs> down, da, 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 da. Do you, you say, know, because you're so boring, you'll yes! love it? <laughs> because all that matters to you is the numbers. You don't care about this hype and emotion like me. Like, I buy people. You buy facts, don't you? Yes. If I can show you facts that prove A, B, and C, would you even bother looking at it? Yes. Okay. Let me send it over. Enjoy your chart. I'll catch up at some point. And then I'll phone them a week later. Did you look at that boring chart? No. Exactly. So why are we even having a conversation about it? That's literally where our conversations go. Yeah, yeah. But I don't like charts. But why should I stop you getting your chart if in your mind you like it? Some people like to sleep without a duvet. Some people like to sleep on with. Like, we're all different. We yeah, can't I think tell it's, every other person it, they're wrong. It's such a great point is don't just sell how you'd want to be sold. Recognize how different personality types like to be sold and have the ability to adapt, right? I've got a lot of people out there that deal with us. And some days I don't want to be really hardball pitching. Do you know how many people, sales directors, they test us. They want to hear me handle nine objections. It is draining. But they know they're testing me. How do you stay to motivated me. to do that day in, day out? Well, you know, there must be some days you think. Sales calls some days. So you, or, know when to, you know when to stop and just say, well, I need some Some days time. I just tell people as well. Is this an audition? And they'll be like, what? I, just, I didn't know we were on the West End. <laughs> auditioning me here or not i mean like, well i want to see if you handle the objections but your sales team shit you've come and i so i literally say that to them. my sales team's already told me they're shit you've already said that i'm good what do you want me to audition for who else is in the lineup for the starring role and the amount of times people are like all right yeah actually let's have a proper but in other times i'm like i'll play your game and they want to hear the script. They want to hear the punchline. But that's because I'm talking to sales directors that have got sales teams. And they think their sales teams are amazing because they train them. It's like telling people their kids are ugly. Like, no one wants to hear that. And that's what happens in our role. You've got to work out who are you talking to? What do they buy? How do they like to buy? Do they want their ego stroked? Do they want to be told their hair's nice? Did it? What do they want? And then give it in a way that feels natural to you sits with your morals, sits with your standards, but gets you business. Ooh, nice. Dave, this has been brilliant. I just realized the time. Like, I feel like we've just started chatting and we haven't. So um, just thank you. I really love the fact that there's a no-nonsense attitude, but it, I don't know if anyone else picks up on it, but it just feels like it's coming from such a genuine place of you've been around this shit. You've seen all the, the funny experiences, the, the tough experiences, and ultimately people just need the truth. They just need... Yes. 
the hard truth and I, that really resonates and um I, I said to you before we started recording, obviously you're speaking at our event in July in Leeds, which I'm really excited about. And I, when I saw you speak a couple of months ago, I just loved that it was just succinct to the point. It resonated. And also you have a bit of fun with it as well. You've got, you have got a bit of a sense of humor, I believe, um, which I just think is really, really great. Just before we dive into the Q&A, last couple of questions that yes. are sort of more general life questions that I like to ask all guests. So, the first one is, what is some of the best advice you've received in your life and why? Hmm. Be the person about being a dad was be the dad. Be the dad you needed when you needed it. And I think that's easy to miss. In business, shut the fuck up and pick up the phone was one of the earliest bits of advice I had. And I used to hate getting on the phone. And the guy was just like, do you have your target? No, shut the fuck up, get on the phone. Yeah. Make a phone call. Talk to someone. And you can take that in any way you want. But if you're going to have a business, talk to more people. Have conversations. If you're shit at having conversations, talk to more. And also, realize how significant you are and realize how insignificant you are in equal measures. Because the world keeps spinning without us here, which is really horrible to think about. But also, the world keeps spinning right here. It doesn't really matter. Do you know how many people, how many people I used to be worried about with this, that, and the other? It still bothers me now. But shit is still going to bother us. But also remember this. If you, if you, if someone does something to you, it's like uh, you're a puppet on a string. If you don't do something because of someone else, it's like they are controlling you like a little puppet. And especially if you don't like that person. For me, the image of someone controlling me and going, I'm making Dave dance like an absolute idiot. And that's what they're doing. And they're trying to do that to win. So those are some of the little things that I had. I hope they're helpful. No, do you know what? That, that just really speaks to me. I've, I've, I know I've held back on selling. I've held back on marketing, showing up, going live when I've received criticism publicly, when yes. I've received trolling, when I've received hate. And just hearing that, they were winning. They were Come to my comment section, honestly, on TikTok. They're fucking brutal. All you need to do is think of some better <laughs> one-liners. Someone said the other day, who said your hair was nice? I literally put, your mum. Like, yeah. <laughs> Come on, Dave, you could do better than that. <laughs> no, no, it's good. Sometimes a little punch one. But having things that you're going to reply to, do you know what, what, why that stuff bothers us? Because we don't know how to react in that moment. I wish people well. I do. I'll go on their page and I'll like five of their things and say, listen, hope everything's all right. Whatever's going on in your world, I wish you the best. I wish you all the success you deserve. If you ever decide to post, make sure you tag me. I'll support the fuck out of you. People hate it. Mm. Yeah, and you. Okay. Like, it, just don't let probably this... converts people. You, you know, it's that thing of it says more about the person when you look at their actions. And I think sometimes they're just having a bad day or they're venting or some shit's going I've on. I've got in people now that are clients that fucking hated my shit. And they went from, I hate you, who is this guy? He's full of shit, to, something will change and then it'll be like this was actually all right he's actually made a valid point and it'll be like there's a guy mate his, his username name ends in 301 and go back like a year and now he's like dave angel's the best we trust in dave angel and now he starts kicking everyone else's asses that's rude on there wow it's better to be known and disliked than to not be known at all because if you are not known you cannot change their opinion but if you are known and you're not liked over time, they get to see the real you. And most people are worried about seeing your consistency. And when you show up as your real ass fucking self consistently over time, people go, fuck. This guy's powerful. This woman's powerful. This person's powerful. If you give in, they're fucking controlling your shit. And now they go home at night and they're like, ha ha. Don't let them fuckers do that shit. Keep turning up, keep doing your shit and live your life. Ah, some power there. All right, let's go to the flip side. What is some of the worst advice you've received and why? Uh, be patient. Fucking pointless. I'm 43 now. I, I look older. I'm tired. My knees hurt. Like the shit I can't fucking do as well as I used to be able to do. And a lot of that shit was about being patient. It does matter. Skincare routines matter. I'm fully aware now I've got fucking wrinkles. So if skincare matters, the way we treat <laughs> ourselves matters, the words that we say matter, they hold value. And if you don't think your words hold value, 
like go and say more shit online because I really believe this. If you don't think your words matter, go and say more shit. If you do think your words matter, go and say more shit. And one of the worst bit of advice someone said to me was, it is the way it is. And it's fucking not. Like, it's fucking not. Everything we have now, good or bad, I take responsibility for. My fucking mistakes, my celebrations, the whole fucking lot. Because when you own that shit, it, it's not what it is. And that comes from my dad, who used to be my hero was my fucking hero. I don't talk to the guy anymore, which is one of the hardest things in the world. But I'm like, fuck me. You fucked your life up. I'm not trying to become you anymore. You're my hero when I was 10. Now I realise your fault. And all his flaws, like he's had a bad life, but he's letting those define him. So your advice isn't valid anymore. And so for me, saying it is what it is or any of that fucking bullshit, it is not. Your life right now, if we reset it right now and the film starts right now, this is the opening fucking credits, you can define it to be anything you fucking want. The only people that know your past are the people who keep talking about it. And if they keep talking about it, that's because they see you fucking changing now. That's why people bring my past up. Because they're like, fuck, this guy's doing all right. Got a funny car with wavy doors and fucking crazy hair and suits. And he's talking on stage and got a cool podcast. Because they're looking at themselves and they're doing the same shit. Gossiping about the same people. And I'm wishing them fucking well buying them lunch. Literally buying. I bought my enemy lunch over though. Paid for his sandwich in the fucking queue. And walked out. Didn't even talk to him. And I reckon that's still rattling around. And the best BLT I've ever brought in my life. I was going, I'll get that. And tap my fucking finger on his cock tap. as I walked out of the shop. Nice. <laughs> Dave, if people are discovering you for the first time, where can they get more of David Angel? Where can they follow you? Where can they get more of your content? Uh, David, the sales angel on most shit. Facebook, I don't really talk on it, um, but it automatically posts there. TikTok, Instagram's the easiest one. I do LinkedIn, but LinkedIn hates me. Um, yeah, I'm there. I am post most days. We go live quite a bit as well. I'm doing more events. Obviously, I'm coming to talk at Matt's amazing event, which is going to be epic. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying to become a bit more. We're pushing ourselves out there more and more to become more annoying to the world. Mm, love it. All right, final question before we hand, uh, head over to the members Q&A. Yes. Dave, what is your personal definition of success? I heard it before. And the, the definition for me, and I hope I don't butcher it, is when your kids are older and they don't have to spend time with you, but they willingly travel to see you. That's my definition of success. And for me, that's the goal I'm working on now. Don't get me wrong, I'm going to have a cool-ass fucking life in a great boat. But that boat's always going to be better if my kids are with me. How well do you think you're doing? I think I'm doing all right. I think I'm, do I think I'm doing all right. I have I'm a 13-year-old girl. My daughter lives with me 28 days in a month. So I juggle this as well as being a full-time dad. My boys are with me half the time. My daughter and me talk 15 to 20 times a day, even outside of she's with me. Um... And we have very open and honest relationships. And yeah, I'm a very fucking blessed guy. So I can always do better, but I think we're doing, we're, we're definitely nailing it at the minute, which I'm happy with. Love it, David. Thank you. So Thanks for having me.